In this screencast, we're going to be talking about a particular example, uh, a couple of particular examples of modeling um, in a process control situation. So, to model a closed loop on a process, one must first construct a combined dynamic model of the actuator, of the process, and of the sensor altogether. So, in this diagram below, all we have is these three. So, this is actually not a closed loop diagram. This is just a linear flow from the actuator to the process to the sensor. And the reason why you have to model all three of these, obviously you have to model the process. But in addition to that, you have to model the actuator and the sensor because sometimes it takes some time for the actuator and sensor to reach a steady state after some parameters change. So in this screencast, what we're going to be looking at is this, um, sorry, in this uh, particular example right here, this variable here, this lowercase c, would be some sort of computer signal which tells the actuator, which is usually a valve, how much flow to be sending to the process. And in a lot of our examples later, this um, lowercase c is also going to be represented by this variable f spec, or the specified flow rate. So imagine in this scenario, your specified fl flow rate, or c, changes, and that causes the valve or the actuator to open further. That opening takes time. Um, as that uh, happens, the flow rate will change over time, and the process dynamics the dynamics of the actual process itself will cause y, let's say the temperature of an outflow stream, to eventually change. Once the temperature changes, it takes time for the sensor to read that temperature to the new value of uh, y. So this value ys will change over time. So in many cases, we can ignore the dynamics of the actuator and the sensor. We can assume that, them, that they're very rapid. However, in other cases, the dynamics of the actuator and or the sensor are on par with the dynamics of the process, and so they cannot be ignored. So here we're going to look at the dynamics of common actuators and sensors. So common actuator models. Well, as I said before, usually an actuator is some sort of valve, which when you adjust it will adjust the flow. And this is the most common kind of actuator in the chemical process control industry. So when the, um, when the specified flow rate to the actuator changes, it does take some time for the actuator or the valve to actually open to the new position. And so therefore we can model the change in the flow rate after the specified flow rate changes as a first order process. And so what you have here is you have your DFDT, which would be your change in flow. is equal to 1 over tau v, where tau v would be the time constant of the valve, and this time constant will be some sort of parameter that's just a, uh, associated with your valve, and it's something that you'll have to measure yourself. Now, each valve will have a slightly different time constant because one valve might be sticky and the other valve might be well well oiled and smooth. In addition to that, you have this parameter here, which is F spec. As I said before, this is your specified flow. This is the um, computer signal that's coming to the actuator that's telling it to change positions. And then F here is your actual flow. Now the time constant for actuator valves is typically between 0.5 and 2 seconds. So it's actually, they're pretty rapid. And the rule of thumb would be for, for and this is generally true for every first order process, after about 3 tau units of time, the process has achieved 95% of the change that, that it, towards steady state, towards its new steady state. After 4 tau, 98%, and after 5 tau, greater than 99%. And so let's say, for example, that you have a particular specified flow rate down here, and then at time t equals one second, that specified flow rate changes to up here. When that happens, it does take some time for the actual flow in your system to reach the new specified flow. And that's typically because it takes some time for the actuator valve to move to the new position. Now in the biotech industry, the most common kind of final control element or actuator would be the variable speed pump. The dynamics of these kinds of actuators are very rapid, and so therefore they can often be neglected. That is, we can usually consider the change in the flow rate to be instantaneous, as soon as the specified flow rate changes. 
Now, as far as sensor models are concerned, there are a few different kinds of process variables that are commonly measured that we want to take a look at. Two of them, uh, first, would be temperature, measured by thermocouples and RTDs, and also liquid level. So the dynamics of these kinds of devices are usually also well represented by first order equations. So you have kind of almost the exact same thing right here. So I'm going to take a look at this one here on the left. So for a temperature sensor, you have a, your change in sensor reading here, or your time derivative of Ts. Ts would be the sensor uh, reading of your temperature is equal to your time constant, or 1 over your time constant. Times the difference between T, your actual temperature, and Ts, which would be your sensor reading, your current sensor reading. Now, again, this is another first order equation, and so it has almost the exact same um, format as the previous first order equation for the actuators. Similarly, uh, when you measure the dynamics of the level sensor, it will also have first order uh, format, and so it's going to be the same thing. You'll have DL dt, DLS dt is equal to 1 over the time constant times the difference between the actual level and your uh, level sensor reading. Now, these kinds of sensors, temperature sensors, typically have a little bit longer time constants than actuators because it just takes some time for the sensor to warm up if the stream that it's embedded in also warms up or cool off. Um, and level sensors are actually very rapid, and so a lot of times we can ignore the dynamics of level sensors. Another common process variable that is measured by sensors would be the concentration. And if you're measuring the concentration of something, then the kind of sensor that you're going to be using is a composition analyzer. Now, this is not true of all composition analyzers, but a lot of the composition analyzers, analyzers are what are called gas chromatographs, or GCs. And these are basically packed columns that have a certain length, and when uh, you put your sample into the column, it takes some time to migrate through the column in a plug flow fashion. And so that time delay that it takes for that um, plug of fluid to go through the column is going to be how you model your composition analyzer dynamics. And so this composition analyzer dynamics would be one of pure time delay. So what you would have is you, your sensor reading of your concentration, sensor reading at time t is right here, and that's what you're interested in. That's your C sub s at time t is equal to your, con your actual concentration at time t minus your time delay theta. And that's what that is. And so over time, what happens is, let's say that at a certain, at a particular time, instant in time, your concentration changes. And it's sort of changing in some sort of slow measure like this. It takes some time for that sensor reading to pick that up. And so if this is your time delay here, theta a, then one time delay after this last point that it changes, it's still reading no change. And so it takes some time, another time delay, for actually the sensor to read any change at all. And so it's going to read this point one time delay later. And it's going to read this point one time delay later. And it's going to read this point one time delay later. And so what you're, gonna, what you're going to get is a stair step matching of your sensor value with respect to your actual concentration.